Hey, my name's John, and um, I'm one of many ministry leaders here at CFA. <clears throat> the past few Sunday services have been dedicated to the topic of creating a culture of invitation. And today is going to mark the last session in this three-part sermon series. Now, in the end, the hope is that the people in the sanctuary, each of us, we'll be taking additional steps in our life to invite people into knowing and experiencing the person of Jesus Christ. And so if you've missed the last few weeks of church and you're hoping to get caught up, um, go ahead and watch those last two sermons online. But before we get into today's message, I do want to take just a couple of minutes to talk to you about a ministry called Alpha. In exactly one month, our church is going to be kicking off the Alpha course. Um, Here's kind of the rundown of how it works. Each Alpha night is relatively the same. Uh, So you come to the church and connect with people over free food. Um, You watch a 30-minute talk exploring an aspect of the Christian faith. And then you break into small groups and discuss with people your thoughts and feelings about the video. In this way, um, people are able to kind of unpack their questions, qualms, curiosities, and build meaningful relationships with people. So Alpha is for everyone, um, whether you consider yourself a mature believer, fairly new to the faith, or a stranger to Christianity. Um, And so I guess Alpha is most especially, though, for those who are kind of unsure of what they believe. Um, They're unchurched or maybe not Christian. It's not by mistake that we are launching Alpha at the same time as having a sermon series on creating a culture of invitation. Alpha, at its core, is about invitation. We'd love for you to come to Alpha, but more importantly, we'd like you to invite someone to Alpha. Friends, family, a neighbor, coworker, classmate, acquaintance. Even better, come with Alpha, come with them to Alpha, and um, then they'll have a bit of a familiar face as they're navigating somewhat of a foreign environment. And so on the screen here, you'll see the details um, of our upcoming Alpha. And so that is um, perfect. It's going to be on Monday nights from 6 to 8.30 p.m. And we're going to start on March 4th, and it'll run 11 weeks until May 13th. If it's helpful for you in any way to remember this kind of stuff, remember you can always pull out your phone and take pictures of things on the slides. Um, And uh, what else do I have to say about that? Yeah, There are many ways to register for Alpha. So um, you can go to the church uh, website, church center app, call the church office, or out in the foyer there is a booth where you can sign up there as well. In fact, we want to make it as easy as possible for you to invite the people in your life to Alpha and spread the word. We've got three tools to kind of help with this. Um, At the exits, um, you will find these squares. They're also out at the connection desk, the booth out in the foyer, some silver tables in the corner, so you can pretty much find them everywhere. Um, But these squares, the people that you give them to, uh, can scan the QR code in the corner with their phone camera, and it'll take them directly to the alpha page on our website. The second thing is out in the booth in the foyer, you'll find these posters advertising Alpha. Feel free to take some, hang them up at your business, workplace, or somewhere around town. And then the third and final way is uh, going to our church Facebook or Instagram page and um, sharing an Alpha post with your friends over social media. Okay, that's a lot of information, um, I know. Uh, Not to worry, Uh, we are going to be making more announcements in uh, weeks to come. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to come and find me. I'm going to be out at the booth in the foyer after service, or feel free to talk to one of the church staff. 
All right, now on to today's sermon. Um, as we've been doing over the last couple of weeks, we're using an alpha resource this morning called Life Shared. So this is how it works. We're going to watch a 15-minute video that's going to be paused twice. During each time, there's going to be a question displayed on the screen. At these points, you're going to turn to the people in the pews beside, behind, and or in front of you. Or if you're watching virtually from home, you turn to the people in your living room and form a breakout group to talk about the question on the screen for five minutes. For some of you, um, it might be tempting to want to just keep that conversation between you and your spouse or a close friend sitting beside you. I do want to try and challenge you this morning to invite other people into your group um, who might have difficulty finding one, especially people who you don't know. So after the video, Pastor Steve will come up. He'll preach on what we've been talking about and watching. And with that, I'm going to get out of the way. Enjoy. If there was a big idea from our first session in the series, it would probably be that God is already at work all around you, transforming lives. And if there was a big idea from the second session, it might be that God's inviting you and I to join him in that transforming work. Now we're in our third and final session, and the big idea for today is around what practical actions you can take to respond to all of this. We want to look at day-to-day -day activities that you can do that will set you up to engage in this work God's inviting us to. And I'm so glad we're talking about this because it'd be such a shame for us to just talk around ideas of reaching others without actually looking at how to do it. I am aware though, that whenever we talk about practical steps to sharing our faith, that it can sometimes feel like formulaic or impersonal instead of relational and loving. So instead of seeing this all as like a formula, the practical actions we want to explore in this session are more like a way of living that can position us to step into the work God's doing around us. Before we get going, take a few minutes as a group to talk about this. Okay, so here's your opportunity to turn to the people around you and discuss this question. If there's people in your group who you don't know, take a quick moment to introduce yourself. And if you finish answering the questions before the time is up, get to know each other a little bit better. Uh, I'll let you know when the five minutes is up. You'll hear a beeping sound, and I'll come and uh, let you know that we're going to continue on with the video.
I was on staff at a large church and I loved what I did, but I had a crisis um, one day, a normal day like any other day, when I came home and my wife had just started inviting neighbors over to share a meal with us. She'd rolled the grill out and as people were coming home, she just said, why don't you come over and we'll share a meal together. And all of a sudden I realized all these people that surrounded me, I didn't even know their names. I was a professional Christian. My job was to help a church get to know the city and the neighborhood. And I didn't even know the people that surrounded my apartment complex. And as we got to know them at that meal, um, we started to share life with these people, people who were going through domestic violence things and dealing with addictions and folks that had all kinds of problems. When I was used to getting into my car to drive to do church ministry stuff, when there were needs all around me. And in a sense, we became the pastors of that apartment complex. So when we went to move to Denver to plant a church, we decided we want to take the great commandment literally, not figuratively, literally, which meant we needed to know the names of the neighbors of the people that surround us, to love them, to serve them, to pray for them. And well, that's shaped what became our church. Everyone that came with us, we made a commitment to spend time in our front yards, to share meals with people in our homes, to hear their stories, to pray for them, to pray with them, and learn how to live life together. And in this, I think we took the great commandment literally to love God and love your neighbor as yourself. And your neighbor actually includes your literal neighbor. And so that small step opened us up to actually thinking about how cities might change. What if everybody took that seriously? What if everyone that says that they follow Jesus took that seriously? But what if everybody took that seriously? We might just see a ripple effect in every city that we're in. Instead of trying to do everything out there, what if we started right in here? The step to take is really simple. It requires walking the 20 or 30 feet and doing this really complicated maneuver, which is knocking on their door and then saying, hi, I live over here. <laughs> I don't know your name. I've not had a chance to meet you. If you're new in a neighborhood, it goes better. But if you've been there a while, it can be even more awkward. And here's why. Because you probably knew their name at some point. Like you met them at one point, and they've just become like cat lady or, hey, what's up, dude, bro, man. <laughs> and you have these super shallow conversations that usually revolve around the local sports team or a restaurant that came to town. And you have to go over a little speed bump, this little teeny speed bump that's awkward, where you say, I know I should know your name. I am so sorry, but I can't remember it. And then my recommendation is that you write it down. Uh, we use a little tool that we call block map. It's effectively a tic-tac-toe board. Just on your refrigerator, make a tic-tac-toe board and just write the names of your neighbors. And that way, when you look at them, you can start to remember them. And who knows? You might even start to pray for them. And who knows even further? God might actually begin to break your heart for them. When you get to know someone's name, something strange happens in our minds where we begin to connect to their story. And we begin to remember parts of their story and we remember their name. And it's the most dignified thing we can do for others is to know their name, capture pieces of their story as a means of demonstrating we care about them. And I think that's what Jesus asks us to do. He asks us to love people. And by this, we show that we're his disciples. That can start somewhere simple by knowing their name, capturing a bit of their story, and then reflecting that back to them. And if you already know the names of your neighbors, here's another, another step you can take, which is maybe you could share a meal with them. Here's a guess about all your neighbors. I have a guess. They probably eat food. Another guess. They probably eat food around the same time you eat food. And if you make a little extra food, and you let them bring some of their food, you can actually share a meal together. And sharing a meal together is one of the most intimate things you can do. And it's actually one of the most 
simple things you can do. I believe that evangelism moving forward will be mostly lived out and worked out through hospitality. That people will open their homes and open their lives to connect with others in a way that they can see the life of Jesus and the hope that God has in their lives by just looking at them, by sharing space with them, by sharing time with them. This is what Jesus modeled. I mean, if you take the parties out of the New Testament, you don't have a New Testament. If you take meals and the connection that we have around food from the whole of the Bible, you don't have a story of the Bible. You take the Passover away. That's a big thing to take away from the Bible. Sharing space and time together where we open our hearts up, we ask questions, and we live life together is best done around food and around a meal and in a place where people feel welcomed. We all have a part to play, and God is so well pleased to use every single one of us if we're willing. If we say, God, use me, he can use you no matter what. On to the second question. And so turn to your groups and talk about what Jay said that inspired or challenged you.
Before we finish off with uh, the video, I just wanted to say something quick. Um, this idea of getting into groups and having conversations during service, I mean, especially three Sundays in a row, um, if I'm being honest, we weren't necessarily sure how it would play out. And I just want to say that uh, we've been incredibly encouraged to see your willingness, courage, vulnerability in turning to the people around you and having these kind of conversations. <laughs> so, um, yeah, when it comes to future Sundays, like, uh, keep having conversations with the people around you. Um, after service, make a point of you know, turning to the person beside you and processing what's inspired and challenged you. Um, as family, like, uh, I think it's key that we wrestle through these concepts together and um, we, we create some meaningful connections. So um, with that, uh, we are going to resume the video and hear Rawa, Matt, and Stephanie's story. My mom left when I was a baby, and my dad raised me until I was four. My dad thought it was best for me to go to Germany to grow up with his sister. I remember the other day when we went to the airport, and I remember holding on to that gate because I didn't want to leave him. I um, hated my father for leaving me. Right. Sending me somewhere I don't know. <laughs> when I was seven, I got abused from my neighbor. I hated God. I hated him for all the stuff I went through. And I was like, oh, if you exist, why would you like do this to me, you know? I um, was looking for a nanny job, and I saw Stephanie's post. You know, I just put an ad out there for a nanny. And so the day that she walked in, we kind of just thought, you know what, this, this makes a ton of sense, let's just do this. Matt was on the phone and he was like, yeah, Daho, we would love to have you as Riley's nanny, and we would welcome you to our family. And I was like, what? This is crazy. We have so many people coming through this house, and she would ask, like, who are all these people? You know, they babysit your kids, and they come over here and play with your kids, and it's like, why would they do that? It's like, oh, they love our kids. You know, we're really involved with each other, and we love each other. We're, we're all part of the same community. She said, well, I'd, I'd love to check that out. So Matt and Steph invited me to church. It was weird, because I'm like, never went to church, ever. They were just so nice and so welcoming, right? And I was like, oh, this is like a different experience. Like, I like going there. I think we were advertising for Alpha. Alpha was just coming back. And I said, you know, this is, would be a great way for you to learn more about what who Jesus is. And I was like, okay, fine, I'm gonna go meet new people. <laughs> and yeah, that was the reason why I went to Alpha first night, I didn't really interact with much with other people. I just like listened and was quiet, I think, the first night. The second night, the third night, I felt like, oh, this is like really powerful, right? Like I started like engaging more and like asking questions. I think it was the time when it was about forgiveness. It was just so powerful that, you know, he forgave us for everything we did and that he still loves us, right? How can he, like, love me when I did, like, so many stuff, you know? How can I forgive myself? How can I forgive people who hurt me? I think that was the moment when the dog I had inside went away and the light came through. Yeah. When you came home, 
uh, and told us that, you know, you wanted to be baptized. Obviously, we're really excited for her. And then when she asked me to baptize her, I was floored. It was really exciting. What was actually so easy, that's the other thing I can't get over, is that I really did so little to like, introduce you. I mean, so much of it is you, just hearing what was true and then just running with it and diving in. Not everyone does that. But then I just feel like I'm getting so much credit for doing no, so little. I mean, just saying, it's go. Not, it's not little. It's like a big, you know, it's huge for you guys to like bring me into your home, you know, trusting me, being in your house and taking care of your daughter. You know, like showing me this, like, oh man, this is this great love God has for you. You know, you should come and experience it too. You know, it's like, it, yeah. it, you know, without you, I don't think I would have it now. So, yeah. <laughs> When I first heard Jay Pathak talk about loving our neighbors, what stood out to me was how accessible it all felt. Praying for people by name, getting to know my neighbors, extending invitation. It's stuff I can do, it's easy. Well, I know it's not easy, but it's easier than how I often make it. And I guess what I mean is these are the kind of practices that you and I can build into our lives right away. But I don't want you to feel like, you know, all this pressure to do it all at once. Just start small, take one idea and put it into action. Start praying for people that you work with by name or introduce yourself to your neighbor or invite a friend to church or to Alpha or to a meal at your home. I found that it's often these small steps that lead to unexpected opportunities. So whatever you do, don't do nothing. Take a step and see what God might do with it. You know, this whole series was meant to help spark a conversation that can lead to new engagement with God and other people in your life. And the beauty of starting the conversation as a group like you've done is that whatever next steps you take, you get to walk them out together, which is way more meaningful and way more fun. And as you share your life and share your faith in Jesus with others, you will get a front row seat to see people's lives transformed by the love of God. Well, when I spoke uh, a couple of weeks ago, I talked about being a people of invitation. And this morning, just for a few minutes, I want to talk about being a people of intention. And if you bear with my foolishness for a moment, I was thinking about what it would be like if we, if we chose to live our lives without intentionality. Just think about it. What, what would life look like if you chose to live without intentionality? Think about it in terms of today. In my life, I probably would not be standing here right now. I probably would have slept in past 9 o'clock without an alarm clock. That's intentionally set to get me up early. Because that's me. I'm just not a morning person. If I did wake up around 9, 9-ish, 9.15, I'd be rushing, I'd run in here, probably be standing here in my sweats preaching to you because I didn't have time to get, pick out my good clothes and get a shower or any of that stuff. And if I did that, I'd probably also be preaching a sermon that I was just kind of making up on the fly as I've been sitting here in the morning because I wouldn't have intentionally prepared a message to speak this morning, and I know that's what you think we do anyway, but that's not what we do. <laughs> and so I preach the message, you may or may not get something out of it, because I may or may not have meandered through all kinds of ideas, and then you leave, and now it's time to eat. So where do you eat? Because if you're not intentional with your life, you may or may not have groceries prepared at your home to go and prepare a meal. You probably didn't have anything taken out to prepare. So you'd say, well, we'll go to a restaurant. So you go to the restaurant and you park outside the restaurant and you go to the door and the door is locked. And the door is locked because they didn't have enough people show up to work today because they're not living intentionally to have the people show up. So the restaurant's closed. So you decide, well, I guess we're going to have to go back home. You get back in your car, you start the car again, and then it sputters and dies because it ran out of gas because you weren't intentional to fill it up this past week. And so now you've got to walk home. And you walk all the way back home. You're exhausted, 
and you cross the road and you get hit by a car. (laughs) Because the person driving is not intentionally looking for people crossing the road and now you're dead. And that's what happens if you live without intentionality. (laughs) I know it's over the top, but I liked it for two reasons. Number one, I thought it was hilarious. Um, And number two, it points out that very clearly in an absurd way, that without intentionality in our lives, it becomes chaotic. And moment to moment, we're just aiming and drifting aimlessly about. The same is true in our spiritual lives. Without intentionality, we also tend to drift aimlessly. And what's interesting, I found this verse and I wanted to share this verse. And as I've been preparing this verse, God showed me this is not what the verse actually says, Steve. You're using it to proof text something you wanted to preach. And so I want you to look at this verse with me. It's found in Matthew chapter 5. It's from the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 to 16. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. This is Jesus saying this. The same, the same Jesus who said, I am the light of the world. He's now telling us, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. And I picked this verse because I love this idea to let our light shine before others so that they may see our good deeds and glorify our Father in heaven, intentionally living out this life that God has given us. And as I started studying this text, I started to realize I'm missing the major point. And I think I've always missed the major point of this text. Salt is salty because of its nature. Salt does not lose its saltiness. Did you know that? Salt can be stored for decades, if not centuries, and will not lose its saltiness. And so Jesus says, you're the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, so what's he saying? How is that even possible? How can salt, the most stable compound, now I'm not a chemistry teacher. Maybe our chemistry teacher friends here might be able to dive into why salt is like that. But it is one of the most stable compounds known to exist. Sodium and chloride. Put them together, incredibly stable, and it doesn't lose its saltiness. So when Jesus says, if the salt loses its saltiness, Jesus is the creator. He knows he's made salt to be this way. It doesn't just lose saltiness on its own. The only way that salt can stop being salty is if it stops being salt if it somehow we do something to it to break it down chemically. And he says in the same way, you're the light of the world. A town built on a hill can't be hidden. You can't hide it. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. You light a lamp so that it gives light to the room. If you didn't want light, don't light the lamp. And I thought this was so profound as I've been studying this text and it took me in a whole different way for what I wanted to share this morning. And it's this. Instead of me getting up and telling you that you need to be intentional in your spirituality, I want to tell you that if you are not being salt and not being light and say you're a follower of Jesus, you are actually being intentional to not be salty and to hide the light. Because if you are in Christ, you are light and you are salt. It is your nature. It will come out of you. And the only way it won't come out of you is if we are intentionally doing things to stop it from flowing out of us. 
And so my message has shifted drastically from what I want to say about how we need to be intentional to, to live this out. And really, my message is about how you need to be intentional to not hide that light or that saltiness. Because if you're hiding it, you're intentionally hiding it. Because in the natural state of salt, it will be salty. In the natural state of light, it will shine light. And that's what we're called to do. And that's what we're called to be. And that's what Jesus has done in us. He has made us to be like this. And if we trace it back through history, this is what God has always desired for his people. When he first called Abraham, he called him into a covenant relationship to walk out to become the people of God. And Abraham only got into trouble when he tried to do it on his own. And we read about that in Genesis 16, the whole issue with Hagar and trying to have a child a different way, not God's way. Then the people of Israel, they're led out of Egypt. Moses goes, leads them out. God gives them the, the law, all of those things. And they're, they were to be a light to the nations. But what they ended up doing was intentionally chasing after other gods and trying to become like the nations around them. And so instead of just living out what God wanted for them, they chose a different path, which was rebellion. The, the one prophet in particular that demonstrates this mindset that was prevalent throughout uh, the nation of Israel was the prophet Jonah. He did not want to go to Nineveh because he hated them. <laughs> Love your neighbor. And he hated them. And he wanted God's judgment to fall on them. And so the entire nation lives this out. They, they failed to be a light for the nations, which is what God wanted them to be, because they intentionally chased after other gods. They intentionally dimmed that light. And so then Jesus comes as the most intentional man who ever lived. And I say this stressing that idea because even in his birth, he was being intentional. And none of us can say we were born intentionally of our own free will. But Jesus of his own free will as God chooses to be born a man. He chooses to be born and then he chooses how he is going to live his life intentionally to shine light on the Father. And then even his death is an intentional death that he says, you would have no authority over me unless the Father has given you this authority over me. And so he willingly goes to the cross. He willingly dies and then intentionally rises from the dead on the third day. His entire life, birth, Everything he did and said, his death and his resurrection, all of it was intentional. The most intentional man who has ever lived. And now this Jesus calls us into living out this life by faith through him. That's what he's calling us to do. In this, in this video we watched, Jay started by uh, saying that pra the practical intentionality in shining um, this light in our lives. It's not a formula. And he's dead right. It is not a formula. And if you make it into a formula, you're missing the point. This is about allowing God's Holy Spirit to do what he desires to do and to flow out of us naturally. I want to point to these three verses. I had picked these verses out to say, this is how we need to live intentionally. But what I've seen since God has showed me this idea of, of he has made us this and we just need to not intentionally stop it from flowing out. Colossians 4, 5 to 6. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt so that you may know how to answer everyone. Now, what Paul is saying here is not so much that we need to be intentional in allowing 
uh, or, or integrating grace into our conversations, but what he is saying is we need to be intentional to not stop the flow of God's grace coming out in our conversations because we are full of God's grace as his followers. And that has to flow out of us. And if it's not flowing out of us, it's because we're stopping it from flowing out of us. And so we have to choose to allow that grace to flow out of our conversations instead of choosing to stop it from flowing out. It naturally wants to flow out. God wants to fill you with his grace so that his grace flows out of you to the people around you. And if you're not living that way, if your conversations are not full of grace, it's because we're doing something to stop that up has to flow out of us because it is the most natural thing to happen that if we are receiving God's grace, his grace will flow out of us. 1 Thessalonians 4, 9 to 12. Now about your love for one another, we do not need to write to you for you yourselves have been taught by God to love each other and in fact you do, you do love all of God's family throughout Macedonia. Yet we urge you, brothers and sisters, to do so more and more and to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life you should mind your own business and work with your hands, just as we told you, so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders and that you will not be dependent on anybody. What, what Paul is saying here, just the same as he told the, the church in Colossae, let God's grace flow out in your conversations. He's saying let God's love flow out in your relationships with these people. And not only let his love flow out, which is in abundance overwhelming, but let that flow out also in how you live and work. So just to be live quiet lives diligently, f- serving your Father, because that's the most natural thing for you to do. And there's a whole sermon here on this idea of a, living a simple work ethic that I'm just going to leave for now. I'll preach it later. First Timothy 1, 15 to 16. Here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Paul is talking about his own life. He is saying the most natural thing for him to do is to walk out the salvation that he's been given in humility because he knows who he really is. He knows the person that he was. He was a murderer of Christians. He imprisoned them. And he's not denying that. He's saying, I'm the worst of sinners. I'm the worst of them. And I don't pretend not to be. In fact, I tell people that it is because of God's patience with me that I am who I am today. And that same patience is here for you as well. He is just living out his new life in Jesus and living it on display as we're called to do for people to see it clearly. Paul doesn't pretend to be anything great. He doesn't pretend to be anything more than what he is. He just lives honestly and openly in front of the people. And this is what we're called to do, to be the light and the salt And if we've said yes to Jesus, and if we are living by faith and following Jesus, that should be the most natural thing that flows out of our life. And if it's not flowing out of our life, now we have to stop and say, well, what is stopping that up? What's holding it back? And there's a ton of things that could be. It could be fear. It could be pride. It could be arrogance. It could be this idea that we are trying to posture and pretend we're something we're not. And it stops all of those things up in our lives. Being a people of intention is not about following a formula. It is about living in the fullness of God's spirit as he (laughs) fills us and overflows in us. I want to share you, uh, with you a story as I close. It's a story about James. James was a kid um, in my first youth ministry in New Brunswick. James came to one youth night, came to a youth barbecue that we were hosting. 
He was in grade 12 at the time. He was this long-haired, music-playing kind of hippie guy. Beautiful long hair, actually. <laughs> Envious. <laughs> and James came to our youth night, came to this barbecue. We had a little conversation, and that was it. It was all good. And then we went to teen camp. We go, went through the week of teen camp, and the speaker on the second last day of teen camp, in his message, talked about the people that God has brought into our lives that he wants to reveal himself to. And he asked us to specifically ask the Holy Spirit who he's brought into your life that he wants you to be more intentional with in your conversations when you go back. And I started praying, and honestly, it was the easiest prayer I've ever prayed because as soon as I closed my eyes to start praying, James's face came right before me in my mind's eye. I said, Lord, and then I saw him. Okay, <laughs> all right. And I knew, okay, when I go back, I'm going to give James a call and say, hey, let's go grab a coffee or something, and I want to get to know you. I go back from youth camp that weekend, and I have to preach at church that Sunday. That Sunday evening, I've got to speak. I come into church, and who's sitting there in church but James? Never been in our church before. He came to a youth barbecue at somebody's house. Now he's sitting in our church that Sunday night. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. I can't wait to talk to him after the service. I preach the message, and I make a response call for people to come to Jesus, and James comes forward. Okay, Lord, <laughs> what is happening here? So I lead him to Jesus in that moment. And I talk with him after, and I say, you're not going to believe this. He said, oh, I probably will. <laughs> I said, when we were at camp, you know, and I explained that whole thing, and that your face came before me. And he said, I totally believe it. And I, I said, I, I'm just, I'm, tell me your story. Like, what is going on that you're here and that this is happening this way? And he said, a year ago, I was praying in my room. God, if you're real, I need you to show me because I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I don't know what I'm supposed to believe. I don't know how I'm supposed to live. And he said, I got a Bible. I tried to read it. I didn't understand anything I was reading. And I go to school this year, and this girl is in my class who's a girl from our youth group. And she's sharing her faith with him. And as he's listening to her talk, his spirit is coming alive and he's saying, I, I think this is real. I think this is true. I think God, this is how God's getting my attention. And so he said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come to her youth group. I want to just see. And he said, I came to that barbecue. I mean, I didn't know. He said, I came to that barbecue and just talking with people. I went home that night and it's like God said to me, this is me revealing myself to you I want to show you who I am through these people. And so he said, I, I had to come to church the next, the next time you had church. And so this was this Sunday. And it's, he said, when you're speaking and what you were talking about, he said, I knew. I know it's real. I know it's true. I know it's God. I'm all in. <laughs> and God had been preparing him long before I even met this kid. And I just wasn't necessarily fully paying attention until that speaker at camp challenged me to pay attention. And this is what I want to do for you this morning. I want to challenge you to just pay attention. To be intentional in what God's already doing all around you. The people that he's already connected into your life. The people that you rub shoulders with that you may not even realize that he's working in their lives. That he wants you to be salt and light for them and he shaped you to be salt and light for them and all you got to do is on stop that dam because the grace and love and all of those things want to flow from your life because God has poured it into your life and it will overflow in you and all he's asking you to do is to take some time Holy Spirit show me show me in my life who these people are and this is how we want to conclude this morning 
in your seats, we've put these um, prayer cards, 1102 prayer cards. They look like this, these little cards. And it's Luke 1102. It's the Father's uh, prayer. Your kingdom come, your will be done. And it's a reminder to pray every day at 1102 for the one, two, or three people that God is going to lay on your spirit this morning. Or maybe later today or maybe sometime this week. But definitely what I want to do, and this is what we want to do this morning, instead of making an altar call for you to come for prayer, we want you to sit in your pew and we want you to speak to the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to lead you through this prayer. Um, Lord, who have you brought into my life? Show me who you've brought into my life that you want me to be intentional with, to pray for. And maybe not only to pray for, but to invite to Alpha. Maybe you're not planning on coming to Alpha. Maybe you can't come to Alpha. That doesn't mean you don't do this. <laughs> because God has brought these people into your life, not so that you can bring them to Alpha, but that you can lead them to him. Alpha is just one great way that we can do that. And so we want you to take a couple of minutes, and I'm going to lead you through this prayer before you leave today. If you have a pen, grab one. There's some in the, the pew seats in front of you. If there's neither one there, that's fine. Write it in your phone. Or maybe you've built such a good relationship through these conversations, you can actually ask to borrow the pen from your neighbor next to you. <laughs> but if you don't have a pen anywhere near you, write it in your phone. Who are the people that you want to pray for? And then transfer it to this card and put this card on your fridge. Put it somewhere that you see, maybe your mirror in your room, that you can remember 1102 every day to be praying for that person, your office, wherever that's going to be. And so let's pray together. Holy Spirit, just as you guided me all those years ago and showed me James's face right now, begin to reveal to your people who are the people you've brought into their lives that you want to reveal your love, your grace, your goodness, your mercy, your forgiveness to. People who are trapped in darkness, people who feel there's no hope. And you want to shine your light into their lives. Show us, Lord, those one, two, three, maybe there's dozens of people. But Lord, let it start with the one or the two that you have brought right on our doorstep that we don't even hardly have to lift a finger. All we've got to do is just say, yes, Lord, let, my, let your grace and your love flow through me so that people might see you in us and glorify our Father. Jesus, I thank you for this challenge these last three weeks and I pray, Lord, that it wouldn't just end here but it would continue to grow in our lives as we endeavor to follow you. Help us, Lord, to live intentionally, not stopping up the flow of your spirit in our lives but allowing your spirit to do what you desire to do in us. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.